Thank you guys so much. I know we got a mix of coaches and players, which I'm super excited about. Uh, also, um, I want the coaches to kind of get in the mindset of when you used to play, or maybe if you still put, uh, as far as uh, how many people still go out there and play in a league or at least play some matches for yourself? Raise your hand if you're still playing for yourself a bit. Okay. All right. Who can remember when you used to play? All right. Good. So that, that's what mindset I want you to get in. And this is not a high performance presentation. This is a presentation for your adult players who play league tennis and specifically play doubles because most adults, as we know, we're just talking to Jeff over there, most adults play doubles these days. And then also your junior players who are maybe not like the rock stars who, you know, are you salivate when you watch them hit and you're so excited and think maybe you got something to be a pro, but you know, you're a decent high school player. This is who this presentation is for. Now, who teaches here? If you're a coach, who teaches adults and who teaches some kids that are like pretty good but not amazing? Raise your hand if you do that, okay? Who only teaches kids who are like unbelievable? Raise your hand if you only teach unbelievable kids. Okay, you only teach. I'm talking about who are going to go pro, okay? So I think this presentation is for everybody then. So we're going to a little bit of the more you can participate in it too with me, the better it's going to be and the less awkward you make me feel. So don't have your hands down here and make me struggle up here like participate okay so the first question i have for you and i know that a lot of you will feel this way i used to feel this way i did pretty good in tournaments but who feels like they play better in practice than in matches or who has students who play better in their practice than in matches so we have some people raising their hand okay so and i would say one of the most common things online that people talk about when we do live streams and I, I mean and you see it right in front of your face as a coach and you feel it when you used to play is you go man how come I can do this in practice then the match comes and you know I just don't I just don't perform the way I want to perform okay so that's what we're gonna go to the next slide for do you get nervous in a match raise your hand if you've ever been nervous in a match okay and uh on a scale one to ten, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna pick on some people, on this, and you can tell me honestly, like if you're like I got ice in the veins, I'm like a one out of ten. I'm not only nervous at all, or I'm like a ten to ten. I'm petrified when I go on the court. Uh, so on a scale one to ten, how nervous do, do you get? Um, man, how nervous do you get on a scale one to ten when you got a big match? I'm yeah, you right? Yeah, you. Oh my god. Yeah. Um, my first match probably a ten, but I think I'm dropping down a little bit, maybe seven eight. Seven eight, okay. And I'd say that's pretty normal. I mean, tennis. We love tennis, it's important to us, right? So I remember when I was a kid and pretty highly ranked junior, I probably went to the bathroom like 10 times in an hour because my biggest fear is gonna have to go have to go to the bathroom on the court for some reason. So, you know, I mean, I, we all have like these nervous ticks. Okay, next one. Can anybody be brave enough and tell me how it makes you feel physically when you get nervous? Uh, do you have any physical things that happen when you get nervous? Oh uh, yeah, mostly just like mental anxiety. Anxiety like feeling. Yeah. Raise your hands if you ever had butterflies. Raise your hands if you ever had butterflies. Raise your hands if you've ever felt like you start getting tight and like your body almost starts to feel like it's not your body anymore. Has anybody ever felt that? Okay, good. So we all know what we're talking about here. Does anyone here, especially our recreational players, does anybody here have like perfect technique on all your shots? DeVore does, he actually does. But no one's raised their hand yet. So everybody feels like there's something we can kind of improve on our strokes. They're not absolutely baked in and perfect like Novak Djokovic, Roger Federer, Serena Williams, right? Is there a shot that makes you very nervous when you hit the ball. Like uh, in the green shirt, what, is there any shot that makes you very nervous in a match that you're worried is going to break down? I want to hit block back a lot, but uh, overheads maybe? Overheads? <laughs> overheads? Let's, uh, Jeff, how about you? Is there any shot that makes you Every nervous? Shot. Every shot. Anything at the net. Every yeah. shot. For me, it could be the backhand. The backhand could do so. Devor, don't hit to my backhand if we ever play. All right? So... We all have that shot. Have you lost to somebody who has worse technique than you or did not have the tennis skills? Raise your hand if you ever walked off the court 
and went, how did I just lose that player? Like, I feel like I look so much better than them. Raise your hand if you've ever had that match. Okay, so, so a lot of you are raising your hands. We got some people raising their hands like this. We got some people raising their hand like that. You make me feel better when you go like this, okay? All right, here we go. Next one. Does, uh, does that tennis player make you uh, a... Is that tennis player? This is, a, this is an interesting one. I don't know the answer to this because I've had some people, um, you know, online uh, who say, well, if somebody uh, has, if they beat you, they're better than you. So if you've lost to somebody that you feel like you have more skill than, do you think that that player is better than you? Is there, are they a better player than you? Raise your hand if you feel like, yeah, if I lost them, they're probably a better player than me. Raise your hand if you feel that way. Okay, so some of you, raise, raise your hand if you go, well, not necessarily just because you lost, but you clearly have more skills. Um, I, I feel like I'm still probably a better player. Raise your hand. Okay, so some people say, yeah. I mean, it's kind of interesting. I, I kind of feel like it all depends on each match and each player. But I feel like there's definitely players out there that have clearly more skills, right? Because if you ask them, like, if I have a clinic, and I say to somebody, hey, show me a serve with a continental grip, and they can hit their serve like that, right? And then the next player, I say, and this happens a lot at 3-0 you know, to 4-0 tennis, and a lot in high school tennis. And then I have another player, and like, show me the continental grip, and they're like, well, I can't even hold it. Well, show me their serve, and they, they go like this, okay? And then I say to some player, like, show me your forehand, and they go like this, right? And then I say, show me your forehand, and they go like that. Well, obviously, the, the player who's able to do the serves, I, I feel like if they know how to put their stuff together, they're actually a better tennis player. Like, and, and they have much more of a higher level that they can go to. But, but trust me, there's so many players out there that they look like this, they look like this, and they're losing the players who do this and they do that. Does there, I mean, does everybody agree with that or does anybody disagree? Okay, cool. All right, let's go to the next one. So here's another one, and this goes for doubles too. There's there's teams. Uh, this is not a just a singles talk. This single singles and a doubles talk because you have you have teams that would be called the pusher team, right? I uh, you know I, I hear some of my female students and some of my male students like, oh, we just lost these like little old ladies. We lost these old men. They just like put the body, they diced us up. So would you rather? This is interesting. Would you rather push? and win or hit and lose who would rather push and win a match raise your hand okay who would rather and this is see how close it is and this survey is probably i think this could go back and forth like a presidential race you know so this because it's 50. who would rather hit and lose raise your hand like man i i'm not going to go that route i'm going to hit and lose uh baron push and win okay interesting i think it's about and and i think that too this is kind of like the conflict we also have in our mind because even if you say today, we, I know there's people who raise their hand like, man, I'd rather, I'd rather hit and lose. And I know you've been in the match or at least I've been in the match. I've said this to myself too. I don't know how many times in the mat, you know, the day before I'm like, I don't care what happens. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to hit, you know, and all of a sudden you want to win and you end up, you know, kind of like pushing. Right. So I think it's also an internal battle we have in our head. This, this is an actual poll I did online and 54% said that they would rather hit and lose then push and win. Only 46% of people want to push and lose. But I think it's kind of like a 50-50 and kind of an internal battle us tennis players have in our head. So what style of player do we hate to play the most? I think almost everybody would say they hate to play the pusher, right? Who, who does not like to play what you would consider the quote-unquote dreaded pusher? Raise your hand if you that's like, you're not really excited. Well, who do we like to play the most? We like to play that player who can hit the ball solid, has a nice hit, right? Well, there's a reason for that too. They're hitting everything in zone three, which is right there, you know? So even though you feel like you're maybe a much better player when you play against those people, they're also giving you a ball that you love, where pushers lots of times give you a ball that you hate up here, down there, slow, sometimes fast. So, all right. So I think 65%, I, I messed that up, but 65% said, anyway, most people hate, oh no, this is actually right. Yeah, 65% of people hate playing pushers. So that is actually a correct number, right? So that is correct. People hate playing pushers. Why? They win. 
They win a lot of matches, guys. Whether you want to admit it or not, pushers win matches. Do you agree with or disagree with that? Pushers win. So pushers win matches. Hitters, they win matches too, right? So if you can go out there and you can hit the entire way through the match and do it successfully, hitters can win a lot of matches too. But another thing, as, as coaches and as players, we have to admit that our field that we have to work with of, of hitters is not as big as, it, as we really have there, okay? There's not a lot of people that you can coach, you know, how to play, and they can actually hit for two out of three sets the whole time and win the match, okay? We're talking about strong 5-0 plus players that we go, just hit the entire time, don't push. That's, it's a very small window of opportunity we have as coaches to just coach hitters, right? To go out there and hit the ball the whole time. Tweeners lose matches, okay? So what, what is a tweener? And I think everybody here, uh, uh, certainly I have felt it, to where you're going out there and maybe you're playing the pusher and things aren't going right and you're like, how can I be losing this person? And you, you don't want to reduce yourself to that level, right? You're going to say, well, I still want to hit the ball. But then you become a tweener and you're going to lose, right? Especially for our rec players out there. If you're out there and you find yourself losing to somebody you don't think you should be losing, you, you lots of times will end up what I call tweening. What is that? It's like you want to hit the ball, but you also want to make it. So then there's something at contact where you kind of decelerate or your racket kind of opens up just a little bit and then the ball flies out or it dumps in the bottle and that. That's a tweener. It's like somebody who's not quite going for their shots, but they're not quite pushing either. And then this is the ultimate nightmare. This is where things spiral out of control you're in the nightmare match. Things get worse and worse and worse. Has anybody out there besides yours truly been a tweener in a match? Raise your hand. Okay, so we have people, a lot of people are raising their hands to be a tweener. Okay, and most of the times when that happens, we lose or even if we win, we walk off the court not really feeling too good about ourselves. So I just explained what that meant. Has anybody here uh, tweened before? We, we already know that we have. Why do we tween? So here's why we end up tweening. Number one, we already talked about it. We've got nerves. We're nervous. Number two is the lack of confidence. We're out there and all of a sudden we feel like we can't go for our shots, but we don't want to totally give up that idea of going for our shots. We've already admitted that no one here has a perfect technical skills and a lot of people that you are coaching, they have technical flaws and not enough time to automate your stroke. Okay, that's what uh, I got to interview uh, Jim Courier one time with, with uh, Gigi Fernandez. And one of the questions from people watching was like, you know, how do you guys hit the ball? How do you guys go for it in those pressure situations? And Jim Curry said, well, Gigi, I think we know the answer. It's, 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 it's automation, right? I mean, they, they hit the ball perfect so many times and they, they're doing it every single day for hours on end when they're already perfect so that they can still look amazing and hit great shots that make us salivate under pressure. And here's a secret that I recently learned. The pros are just as nervous as you guys, if you can believe it or not. For our coaches who are pretty good but maybe not great, and for our recreational players who are 3-0 to 4-0, the pros get just as nervous, maybe even more nervous than we do but it doesn't show because they've automated that stroke. All right, now who has seen, um, what, what was it called, break point? That was one of the things like, man, these pros are like a nervous wreck. Do you see how like insecure they were? I mean, like, they, they'd lose matches and what would they talk about? they talk about like retiring after a match and, and they'd be crying, they'd be like they were no good. And then another thing is, let's see if I have the slide, I don't know if I don't know. Uh, how, can, uh, how come they don't swing? Because they automate. So Gigi Fernandez, this came from Gigi Fernandez's secret. And uh, my guy put the wrong, that's supposed to be a picture of the Bryan brothers. But it's Jack Sock who played with uh, the Bryan brothers. But, but uh, the Bryan brothers were, were talking and I think it was Mike. And somebody asked him, what do you think about tennis now that you're retired? 
And he said, he says, actually, I like, I really like it. And the ball feels great when I hit it. He's like, when I played, he's like, I was so tight. And I'm thinking, really? Like you guys looked so comfortable and confident, you know, it was like amazing to me that he said that, that he felt so tight out there. And, and he said, so now when I hit, I'm just so loose and relaxed because, you know, it's not as important anymore. And he said, here was the thing that blew my mind. He's like, in fact, I think there would be a lot less injuries on the tour if everybody could relax more. That, that he feels like a lot of injuries are coming from the players are so tight. Because, I mean, imagine you don't win, you don't get paid. Right? I mean, tennis is a brutal sport when we think about being on the professional tour. And if you don't win, you don't, you don't get paid, especially if you're somebody trying to stay in the top 100. So you can imagine how nervous and tight they actually get. They don't look like it, though because they've automated their strokes. They, they've been perfect probably since the time they're like 12 years old and then they keep playing like crazy all the time. Jim Kerr says automation, so I kind of went through all this. Here's the catch. So in order to look like that under pressure, you've got to have your stroke baked in. You've got to have it perfect already and You've got to hit a ton of balls every day. I remember going to Indian Wells when Djokovic uh, was there and, and uh, he had on the schedule two hour practices two times a day. Guy's number one in the world. You don't get much more perfect than that. That's how many balls he felt like he still needed to hit at that time. I think he plays a little differently now. I don't think he hits as much uh, in between his days, but he was hitting a lot. It was, it was probably back 2014, 15, somewhere around there. So. They're hitting tons of balls and they're already perfect. And remember, this, this speech is not for pro players. It's not for your top rated juniors who are amazing. It's for the majority of our students who are 3-0 to 4-0 or they're decent high school players. So we already went through the why. All right, now, tennis is the closest thing that I can think of to golf especially when it comes to club head speed, right? So in order to go out there and be a hitter the entire match, the entire match, you've got to have your technique baked in just like a professional golf player, right? Because what happens on the golf course? Who here has played golf? Okay. So somebody answer me. When you're on the driving range, what happens on the golf course when you drive and it's not a, a perfect hit? What can happen to you? Somebody tell me. Nothing. Nothing? You can whiff it? What else can happen? I thought you had consequences. There's no consequences. There's lots of consequences. If you're on the golf course and you hit, a and you hit it not perfect, where does it go? Where does it go, guys? It goes in the way. It goes anywhere. Right? It goes anywhere. If you're a little off, in golf, you're way off when it comes to club head speed. If you're going to bring the club head through quickly, if you're just a little off, the ball can go anywhere and go off to the side. It could go there, right? Now, if you're, um, let's see what my next slide is here. So I'm going to go through how we deal with this. But think about this. And again, we're going back to recreational tennis because a lot of times, even as coaches, we tell our students, you know, hit the ball. I'm tired of you just like pushing the ball, right? Now, okay, if you're working with a top level junior, maybe you can tell them that, okay? And things will get better, right? But think about if I'm, go back to that golfing analogy. If I go to swing and I'm a little off, the ball is going to go way off. If I'm, and, and let's say I, this, this young man's right here and I'm about to drive, right? What would I probably tell him if he's staying right there? Would it be smart for me to drive? Whose son is this? Okay, would you like me to drive right now with him staying right there? You tell him to back up, right? You say, son, you get out of the way. You don't know what's going to happen. You, you know, you might get killed there. Now, what if I'm playing putt-putt golf with you guys and he's staying right there and I got to hit a putt right there? Are you, are you grabbing? It's fine, right? Because only so, I might not make the putt, but only so much can go wrong there if I'm going to putt it that way. You're not fearing for his life. Okay, that goes to show the difference that can happen on the golf course, right? It's the same thing in tennis. If you go to swing, and even if it looks pretty good, right? We know a, how many times have you hit a shot 
that it looked pretty good, but all of a sudden it went into the fence. Have you ever done that? Or you hit a shot, it looks pretty good. It goes in the bottom of the net, right? Because if you're a little off, you're way off in tennis too, okay? Where, why do, why do pushers win so many matches? Because if they're not bringing a lot of racket head speed to the ball, only so much can go wrong with that. Even though maybe it's not the greatest looking shot or it's not the greatest shot ever as far as like placed, it still is in the court lots of times, okay? So here's how we deal with that. Developing a hitting technique and a pushing technique that is deployable in matches and paying attention to our confidence meter. If you want your students to win more matches, whether they're playing 3-0 to 4-0 tennis, or your high school kids who are out there and you know they're pretty good but not amazing, if you want them to win more matches, I think we want to have them develop a hitting technique and a pushing technique that is deployable. That means it's going to work and matches and here's another thing too i don't know how, you know every coach is different but i can tell you what people are gravitating towards online you know who's going out there and typing in how to hit a forehand that looks like roger fetter how many times how many you think a lot of people are probably searching how to how to hit a forehand like roger fetter type that in if you think they're typing that in on youtube no one thinks they're typing that in everybody's typing that in Everybody's going, how do I hit a forehand like Roger Federer? How do I hit a backhand like Novak Djokovic? No one's typing in, how do I hit a nice push forehand? Who's typed in on YouTube? How do I push a forehand? Right? We all should learn how to do it better. You want to win more matches. And that's another misnomer because when you hear the word push, we think suck, right? No good, right? But here's the thing, when Roger Federer hits a sliced backhand. Is he hitting it or is he pushing it? Right? Look, this is hitting a backhand, right? This is pushing a backhand. Pushing doesn't have to be ugly or gross or terrible looking. It's becoming a lost art though. We should all be teaching our kids how to push a forehand in, how to push a backhand in more right? So that when they're in a match, they don't feel like they only have the option of like, man, I, I got to step on my game. I got to hit better, right? Because if they don't know how to have a good conversation with their confidence meter, they're going to lose. And you're going to lose if you're a player here watching this. So what is the confidence meter? And the confidence meter can change from point to point and shot to shot, right? So a confidence meter that I've kind of like developed over coaching so many recreational players is here would be an example of a low confidence meter. Come on, Rick. You know, it's like, first of all, uh, Jeff, let me ask you this question. W do you enjoy returning slow, wimpy second serves? You do. You're an exception. Who, who here hates... Slow, wimpy, second serves. <laughs> All right, some people hate serving. All right, but, but, I, but a lot of people that I've uh, heard from, because I run a lot of camps, they tell me, you know, actually, I hate the slow serves more than a fast serve. I hate dealing with those things, right? And, and, and what do we think we should be doing, though, with the slow, wimpy, second serve? Most people will tell you, Man, I just need to learn how to crush that thing. I mean, it's it's a sitting right there. I should just cr I should just be able to Pete. I should just be able to step up and crush that thing over and over again. Is that realistic for two out of three sets? Is that the answer? Right, especially when you're seeing that you've already dumped three or four. You're getting super annoyed with yourself, and so your answer is usually give yourself a pep talk, like, "Come on, Rick, hit the ball, man. Stop being a baby." You know, just crush this thing. Go for it. Does Rick have a high confidence meter or a low confidence meter right now? On a scale of 1 to 10. It's very low. It's very, very low. When you're talking to yourself like that in a match, you have a low confidence meter. So the chances of you yelling at yourself and telling yourself to hit the ball and just go for it and actually doing it 
in my experience of seeing thousands of players in front of me are very low. Are there exceptions to the rule? Yes, there are some people who can give themselves a good kick in the butt, tell themselves to hit the ball, and then they actually do it and actually make the shot and they play better. Most people, when they start talking themselves like that and still try and hit through the ball, they are going to lose. Go to Vegas, put money against them, they're gonna lose the match. Because they have a low confidence meter and they're still telling themselves that hitting their way out of it is gonna work when they don't believe that they can actually ma make the shots anymore. Okay? <laughs> yeah. The only, the only thing, like, with that confidence meter, let's, like, I played Division II college. Not a great player, but good Division II college. And I had this Eastern forehand, really flat Eastern forehand, and I'd get tight in the match, and I'd push a slice forehand. And I could get that ball in every time with that inside out slice forehand, but I'd have to win three sets of these eight hours long matches. But once you go into push and you tell your student to push, it's very hard to go, okay, I'm making all those pushes. Let me go back to driving that flat Eastern forehand. You see what right. I mean? It's a yeah. confidence meter. So you think it's okay to teach the push and have them, they can still, with the confidence level, get out of that push and drive it again? Absolutely. Okay. Th that, that's my point. It's like you want to teach them, you want to work with your students and have them be better and better at hitting so they get better technique because that's the answer. If you want to hit, if you want to hit for two out of three sets, you want to go out there like, man, I'm not pushing. I don't care what this dude said who came and talked to us. I ain't pushing. I'm hitting. Well, if you want to do that, what does it require? It requires perfect technique. It requires excellent timing, right? It requires acceleration, right? To hit the ball, the, the cool thing about hitting the ball is the faster you swing at it, if your technique is perfect, your timing is great, right? And your confidence is high. The faster you swing, the stroke is going to reward you more and more and more. We got a pro back there. Am I right? I mean, if all that aligns, the faster you swing, the ball's going in, right? But if one of those things goes off, what happens? Nightmare, disaster, shank, right? So that's why you've got to keep checking in yourself on the confidence meter. Because if you have, because, and it changes from point to point, shot to shot. Right, so if you're out there and you're at a state of mind where you're like, okay, second serve's coming, you know, I'm gonna go for it, and it's a beautiful day out here, and I feel good, I feel loose, and gosh, you know, if I miss, I don't hate myself, I can live with it, right? If you're talking to yourself like that, your confidence meter's high, right? So then go for it. And, but I think you're gonna have a lot more confident players when you have this conversation with them and you tell them, hey, look, we're adding, we talked about golf, we're adding a lot more clubs into your bag, guys. You can, when you get nervous, it doesn't mean that because you're going to chip the ball that all of a sudden you're a defensive player and you're going to have to go back six feet behind the baseline and just carry a ball in. You can push and still play super aggressive tennis. I mean, the interesting thing is, in the 60s and 70s, probably our most aggressive style of tennis that we've had, the pros more pushed their shots than hit their shots, right? Not saying that they didn't hit the ball hard. When you push a ball, it doesn't mean you're not going to hit the ball hard. I'm talking about more of a technique. You know, you get a second serve, you push it. Like if I cut connect with that, that ball can go very fast and stay very low. And now I can come to the net and put a volley away. Did I just play defensive tennis? Did I play baby tennis? No, I played pretty aggressive tennis. That's what a lot of people did in the 60s and 70s. Just because you're pushing a shot doesn't mean you become a defensive wimp either. That's not what I'm saying. Go ahead. So you might have just answered this a little bit, but how do you relate kind of pushing versus someone like, um, you know, O'Shaughnessy, Craig O'Shaughnessy, who, you know, who says that, that generally players don't just miss. They, you know, there's, there's, there's always a, there's a reason that their opponent gave them to, uh, to miss. And so you've got to, you got to kind of find ways to do that. And, uh, well, well, that's true. But again, remember, Craig O'Shaughnessy is coming up with stats of the pros. Well, he's done trouble. He's done yeah, trouble. I, I'm, but I'm telling you, I love Craig O'Shaughnessy. He's great. I'm not saying he's not great. And I'm not saying you're not losing points because somebody made you do something. But what I am telling you is there's a lot more self-inflicted wounds that come on a recreational court 
then is going to come from that guy missing. You're going to have to do something to make him miss. Me, you have to do a little bit to make me miss. A 3-0, you don't have to do much. Lots of the wounds are just like, <laughs> right? I'm nervous, right? So at a recreational level, there's a lot more that you can do to not miss shots, especially if you realize you have more tools and it's okay to be pushing a ball and hitting the ball, right? Let me see, I might, I might not have any more things here. Let's see, no, so that's the end of it. So the, the trick is, what, what is the answer? For every single player, it's different. You've gotta figure out, the magic answer is to be able to talk to your confidence meter from shot to shot, point to point. The better you get at it, the more it can become a subconscious thing and you, you pick the right shot. And you have to figure out what percentage of your style should be hitting versus pushing. For some of you, if you, you can hit 80% of the time and you only have to like go to the chip 20% of the time. For others of you, since you, you grew up and you're much better at you know, this style of play and you know, you're developing this a little more, then maybe you should be pushing 80% of the time and hitting 20% of the time. One of the best players I've seen lately in recreational tennis, can I have a racket? Okay, cool. I'm going to tell you, and I'm not kidding. She was one of the best recreational players I've seen in the last couple of years. And my student, and she's a super sweet lady, my student who watched her play, but she kind of like talked like, oh, she doesn't look like she's real. And I watched her play too long. Like that woman is damn good. Right. And my student that, that kind of put her down has great technology. Her forehand looks like this. Her backhand looks like this. Her serve looks like that. If I had to put money on who's going to win, I'm going to pick the other woman. I'm sorry. I hate to, I hate to put, throw my student under the bus. The woman served like this. I'm not kidding. She held the racket here. She put the serve in play, right? And then when she hit her ground strokes, she choked up here. This is where she hit her ground strokes. She pushed most of her shots. And then every now and then, when the ball was sitting up and she felt good, she could also drive one right by you. Like she was deadly. And with her chip, she could put it right at your feet. She could lob it over your head. She could hit it fast. She could hit it floaty where it's like whirling up there. She could do everything with the ball. I mean, she, for recreational tennis, she was a master with the ball. And then she could also hit it. But she was probably pushing 80% of the time, right? And hitting 20% of the time. There's other people that should be 50-50. It could be point to point. But what I want the coaches to just kind of walk away with is unless you're like trying to develop somebody to go on the pro tour, you know, it, it shouldn't all be, because I mean, I remember one of the biggest, now I was a good player, okay? But I mean, I, I, know, I know how many times I've heard a coach like, stop pushing, hit the ball, blah, blah, blah. It's not going to happen unless your kid has great technique, right? Or your, 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 your adult player has great technique. Because remember, to, to hit the ball successfully for two out of three sets, and he agrees with me, right? The best player here right now agrees with me. In order to hit the ball for two out of three sets, you've got to have everything aligned. You've got to have perfect technique. You've got to have amazing timing because it, it requires acceleration and your confidence level has got to be very high. If one of those things falls off, you are in for a nightmare match. But if you realize like, okay, last couple points, I'm not hitting the ball that great. I still have a nice chip return. I still have a nice little drop shot. And by the way, if you study the pros and you really watch them, they push a lot too, right? It's just that it takes a lot more for them to decide they had a pushing shot, right? So when Djokovic is like hitting inside the court, he's hitting the ball. But when he gets stretched out and he turns into Gumby, what does he do to get the ball back in play? He pushes the ball back in play. When Alcaraz hits two or three big forehands and then he backs his opponent up to the fence, and then he hits a drop shot. Did he, did he hit the drop shot or did he push the drop shot, right? So that's my only thing is like get these students amazing with the continental grip, right? And get them great and, realize, and give them the, the power to go, you've got a lot of tools now. You don't have to hit your way out of a match. You can pick and choose what you have to do. You've got, you've got now got like 10 options rather than this one option. And I think that that's, the biggest thing where, where students' confidence really falls off the map, like 
man, if I can't find my shots, and most people, no one thinks of their shots as like finesse and pushing the ball around. They always think of their shots like big shots. And they think like, if I can't find my shots, I'm going to lose. And then if they can't feel their own body, where are the odds of them finding their own shots? So there you go. So that's hitters win, pushers win, tweeners lose. Any questions? Okay, so how would you, because I, I, I agree, like, I like being able to like, teach a kid, let me say push, slicing, drop shotting. Yeah. But how do you, how do you teach a kid to push? Like, do you want them to slow the ball down? Do you want them to have more racket skills in terms of learning to play continental? Yeah, I think I think a lot of just like a lot of ball skills, you know, uh, you know, even this starts with stuff like this, and 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 just and just really um, giving them the confidence that that is a real shot, you know. I mean, adults say to themselves, kids say to themselves, and coaches say to kids and 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 to their adults, that's not a real shot. Like even we just talked about, you hit lobs, and your opponent said you're not playing real tennis. What's the score? <laughs> Who's winning? And it's real tennis then, you know? One of the things that I've been trying to say to my players lately is how, what position are you in as far as where, how the racket should travel here? Okay? Yeah. So if I'm in perfect position and lined up, I'm going to take a full trip, a full travel with my racket. But as far as the push goes, that's a short travel there. Yeah. Like the racket just to butt back. Here, exactly. Forward. So, and sometimes break it down with travel, like they're yeah. not thinking as much about technique. Yeah. You're out of position. Let that racket travel short. Let that rabbit, you know. I love that. A big ball here. Let's travel that racket on a large trip here, you know. Yeah. So that's one of the things that's pushy. I think that can help. Yeah. Oh, oh absolutely. Absolutely. Love that. I love that. Yeah. To me, as a kid growing up, and now what I see, you know, with some young players, when I'm working with some young players, it's a mini tennis game. Yeah. Simple as that. Mini tennis game, the slice is only allowed. No volleys. Yeah. So now they, they're forced to, you know, basically work with their hands a lot, right? They're forced to use the field. Yeah. And obviously they're moving really well at the same time. It's all, you know, playing through the whole service box, right? So yeah, absolutely. And and, and, and then we're just going... Really, you know, you really have to feel, okay, when I play deep, yeah. when I play short, yeah. right? Because if no volleys are allowed, yeah. then one of the options, you know, push the opponent back first and play shorty angles or, you know, like a drop shots or whatever, right? So it's kind of, but only with the continental grip. Yeah, there, right? yeah. And, and one of the cool things that... Actually, uh, I was working at a, a high-level performance program, and, and one of the things that I love that the coach actually did is uh, a lot of times in warm-up, especially starting mini tennis, you hit one topspin, you chip the next one. So you also get comfortable at changing your grip from shot to shot. Anything else? Do you have thoughts on an underarm serve? Do you have thoughts on an underarm serve? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's not a bad, I, I'm not, I'm not against it for sure. Cause I mean, it, the, especially the game has changed, you know, I mean, most people are staying way back at the fence and the more the kids watch people staying way back at the fence and then you got a 15 year old uh, boy or, or girl who can hit a bomb serve, you know, they're, they're going to do what they see on TV. They're going to go back to the fence. So, I mean, I think, I think it's a legit play now to hit the little short one in for sure.